This workshop today is titled The Neurobiology of Adolescent Mood, and our presenter is Dr. Bonnie Climes Dugan. In this session, she'll talk about what stress looks like in the neuro neurobiological system of teens, um, how it can change their development, and why adolescence is a very important time to intervene. We have two work workshops later today that I want to make sure that you're aware of. Um, Right after lunch, uh, Dr. Nimi Singh, who was our keynote speaker this morning, will speak about the role of lifestyle in stress and coping for youth. She'll talk about how lifestyle uh, impacts health and how to help people make how, how to help young young people make healthy choices in their everyday life. And then after that, uh, Dr. Ann Garrity will speak about teens at risk, creating healthy relationships that regulate. Um, she'll speak about how to work how to engage teens so that your relationship with them becomes a self-regulating force for them. So we look forward to seeing you at all three sessions. And uh, two, three notes before we begin. First, if you could turn off your cell phones or shift them to vibrate, that would be much appreciated. Um, also, if you could complete the evaluation form. If you don't have one in front of you, there are extra ones sitting on the tables around you. Um, and there will be a box for you to drop them in on the way out. And then third, we are videotaping each of the sessions today. Um, and that's so that we can capture this whole day and put it online on our website afterward. So it will be on the consortium's website, which is on the bookmark that you got as you came in. And there's more copies of the bookmark back at the table. Um, so I will let um, Dr. Bonnie Climes Dugan introduce herself, but please join me in welcoming her. Thank you so much. So the room is full. Now this is a surprise to me because my topic is the neurobiology of adolescent mood. I didn't scare you away yet. In fact, I'm, I was thinking about, you know, how did I get into this topic? What gives me the authority to come up here and give you a talk on the neurobiology of mood? I thought I'd just tell you a little bit about my journey to coming to this topic. Um, when I was in sixth grade, um, my mother was getting her doctorate of education, and she had all her textbooks out on the, on the table, and I liked her abnormal psych book, and I thought that was a kind of interesting book. And it wasn't particularly precocious, um, but it looked kind of interesting. But that same year, I had three people that I knew commit suicide. And I started to look at that book for answers because it seems like such an odd occurrence of why people would commit suicide. And that was probably the start of what has brought me here with all the questions that I have. And I figure this topic, the neurobiology of adolescent mood, could I run out of issues to examine in this topic? I mean, I have several good years of my career left, I believe. And um, I also believe that it's not an area that I'm going to fully exhaust by the end of my career. And so I hope that today you can come along with me on some of the journey of the, some of the interesting things that we are starting to know about the neurobiology of adolescent moved. And it is just a brief introduction to this topic. So we're going to um, hit on some of the interesting um, discoveries. I actually um, got my undergraduate degree in occupational therapy at Loma Linda University and then um, worked for a couple years as a psychiatric OT before I went to get my um, degree in clinical, my PhD in clinical psychology at Florida State um, University. And um, from there I did my internship at Duke University, my postdoc at a National Institute of Mental Health and was a professor at Catholic University in Washington, D.C. I um, have been here at the University of Minnesota for the last 10 years, and I still feel like I'm a visitor here in um, the state of Minnesota, but I love um, the state of Minnesota. I did have a husband who was a true Minnesotan that dragged me back here and um, have come to to love um, everything, including the winters of Minnesota. Um, maybe more than maybe more than some of you, huh? That are <laughs> um, so. Um, with that, um, in the last several years here at the University of Minnesota, I'm going to give you some of my research, but um, talking more broadly about adolescent mood today. Um, 
we've been having the opportunity to um, research this topic. So as a professor, I contribute most to this um, effort. I don't see um, clients individually. Um, I conduct research in the area of adolescent depression. And back at the very back, there are some flyers if you're in the Twin Cities or you want um, you know, somebody that might want to participate in research or get free treatment or things like that. We have a number of um, research projects that are going on in our group. The other way I contribute to this effort of getting information out there is I teach undergraduate and graduate courses at the U. Um, I teach intro to clinical psychology and abnormal psychology. And um, I always bring in aspects of the lecture that I'm going to give today um, to um, my lectures there because they're so highly relevant to those topics. And hopefully some of the students that I'm teaching now will be here at the conference in years to come um, because um, they have been inspired to do the work that you all um, are doing. And I know we come from very um, different um, areas of expertise. And um, hopefully what I have to say today will um, hit on some of your interests. So I have no um, financial disclosures. Um, so emotional development in adolescent. Um, the transition through adolescence is accompanied by physical, psychological, and social changes. We know that. But these changes are associated with experience that elicit novel and intense emotional arousal, requiring emotion regulation. I'm going to be using the word stress regulation and emotion regulation relatively interchangeably here because, in fact, stressful situations do elicit strong emotion and um, they require us to regulate that emotion. And so you might think of how we, what we're confronted with. Now, the most what we know in the neurobiology of stress really has to do with more of these bare encountered situations. But we can't do these life or death situations, so we have kind of minute bare encountering situations where people get stressed. But if you are like me, um, perhaps some of the stress that you encounter is that drip, drip, drip of the stress, that feeling of maybe not getting that last client's report written or such um, the pile, papers piling up. Adolescents do experience some of those similar kinds of um, stressors. Um, they don't particularly relate to those pictures that I showed, but they do have relationship stressors, parents, college, keeping up, fitting in, overscheduling, expectations with school and work, and tremendous amount of stressors that they're experiencing. And those are relatively mild sort of stressors or ongoing stressors, but they may have trauma that they experience or um, other deprivation, like food insecurity. Some of the people that you're working with may um, have those kinds of stressors. And today what I'm going to do is to talk to you about the continued maturation of multiple systems that underlie emotion or stress regulation. We're going to be looking at two systems and explaining them in terms of how they interact with the stress system, the neural system and the physiological stress system. So the objectives today are to answer these three questions. How does the neurobiological stress regulatory system develop? So thinking about how it is, develops in normal adolescence or typical adolescence. How might the development go awry? And here I'll be using my area of research, um, examples of um, adolescent depression. And then how do these advantages um, provide hope for effectively intervening? advances, sorry. So when we know more about the stress regulatory system, how might we apply that um, to our interventions? So let's start with the first question. Now the ner nervous system is made up of um, both the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. And all of these systems are integral to stress regulation. However, I'm going to be focusing on two key systems that have to do with stress regulation. I'm going to be talking specifically about the brain, 
um, not focusing as much on the spinal cord, so that arm of the central nervous system. And then I'm going to be talking about the sympathetic nervous system. Specifically, I'm going to be focusing on the stress hormones, the physiology of our stress hormones today. And so um, when we encounter a stressor, and let's use the example of a bear because that's going to be a, a, a better analogy for this work. We take information in through our sensory system. So we take information in. We might see the bear or we might hear the bear. So we're alerted in some way that there is a bear in our presence. And I want you to use the analogy of a bear to think about the stressors in your life as well, because um, that will help it um, come to life. We have this sense that there's some danger. Well, is it helpful? Is it adaptive if we do nothing with the bear there? It, it isn't, right? We need to respond in some way to that bear. And so we often have automatic responses. The automatic response is what we call this low road. We get the information in, we have this automatic response or the low road, immediately we, our system becomes alerted. We're on edge. There's something we need to do. Most people either would freeze or run when they saw a bear. Those are the two sort of um, survival instincts that we have. But that impulse goes immediately to these deep centers of the brain that we're going to talk about. The limbic system, the amygdala being sort of the core of that limbic system. And so we do something without really thinking. But you might, now you all, as, as good Minnesotans, hopefully you know more about what to do when you encounter a bear than I do. And I was realizing as I came up here, I should have done my homework. Like, what do I do when I encounter a bear? <laughs> Because my undergraduates are all, you know, like most of them are from the Twin Cities, and they don't know any better than I do when, they, when I give them the examples, you know. So, um, but um, after you have these immediate reactions to this threat or stressor, you might also think about, oh, what did I hear on that television program? What, I'm, what am I supposed to be doing? And there, we're recruiting our brain, our frontal lobe of our brain. We're starting to think about helpful strategies. What should we be doing? Evaluating the strategies that we are already engaged in. Was I supposed to freeze? Or was that when you're looking at like you're submissive and the bear is really going to come attack you? Or is that a good strategy? You know, so those kinds of um, ideas. And so here we are all, um, this figure right here is talking about what the brain does. But the brain doesn't operate in itself. It doesn't operate by itself. In fact, it recruits our whole physiology to help with this process. And so the way that we activate our physiology is also important. So where that arrow says the emotional response, it is an emotional response, but we also show a stress hormonal response that I'm going to be talking about today. So alerting the amygdala that there is some threat then also will activate the stress hormonal system. And that's what I'm going to be talking about with the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, or just the HPA axis, we'll say for short. So let's start with the idea of brain development. Um, as the organism is developing, um, we see that um, there's this nice progression that occurs. And in fact, um, this is um, neonatal development that occurs. Um, most of the functions of your brain are established um, by um, the age of two. And in fact, um, the brain is, um, is similar in size um, at, for a two-year-old than it is um, for the, an adult. Um, by, actually, by the time you're eight, you have a, a, almost an adult-sized brain. And so we see this progression, this nice progression that's taking place, an orderly progression. And what I'd like you to be aware of here is that our, the way that it starts out is more like a tube, a tube of neural matter that then folds upon itself. And this, this folding process that's occurring that you can see going on here um, actually ends up being the structure of your brain. So the frontal lobe of your brain has these unique connections to the internal part of your brain, um, the temporal, which would be these um, 
side portions and um, the um, limbic um, portions of your brain. So there's this folding onto e each other's structure. The, <clears throat> the areas of the brain that we're going to be focusing on today, focusing on today um, have to do with um, the, the deep part of the brain, the limbic structures. This is where threat is detected, emotional responses occur and also the frontal lobe of the brain. And so those are, um, we, don't, we don't have to know everything about the brain for this particular lecture, um, but I will be referring briefly to things like the amygdala and the hippocampus and the frontal lobe. And so let's just talk briefly about what role they have. So the amygdala, like I said, is that threat detection s system. It lets us know something is amiss, something is different in our environment. It definitely pays attention when something is threatening to the individual. The hippocampus is very closely um, connected with that um, amygdala, that threat system, and it is that memory center. So it gives us some context uh, for um, this threat. Have we seen this kind of threat before? Those kinds of things. It, but it's important because it gives us um, a memory of what kinds of threats might be important to continue to pay attention to. The frontal lobe is the regulatory center of the brain, and that's where we have um, delayed responses, we think about things, we're reflective, um, our executive control centers of the brain. The way that um, we measure these types of um, systems, have, um, we ask people now to go into the MRI, and we can take pictures of their brains. It's been a, a tremendous advance, and that's really where um, some of the most remarkable advances of this field um, have been in the recent, um, the last decade or so. And so we see that the prefrontal cortex, or the very front part of the brain, is what we're going to be most interested in, in terms of planning and control. The amygdala, we're going to be interested in terms of attention to stress or threat, and the hippocampus, interested in for the memory um, aspects. I'll be um, briefly describing it as the frontal lobe or the limbic lobe, and those are the two centers of the brain that we'll be focusing on. And then, just um, as a refresher, I know you think, you're thinking, oh my goodness, she thinks we're in um, biology. She's insulting us. We don't even know what a um, nerve looks like. But I will just go through these very briefly so we're all on the same page. So a nerve cell is the basic communication system of the brain, as you all know. And um, the cell communicates through these, um, the syn synapse down at the bottom. And it sends an electrical impulse um, through um, the nerve cell to connect to another nerve cell for this communicative process, which is really important as we're understanding the stress system. I want to just point out a couple of things about the nerve cell. In terms of the way we understand the nerve cell, um, through pictures, we can actually look at um, the cell body that is what we typically describe as the gray matter of the brain, the thinking matter of the brain, that, that's the, um, the cell body. And then the white matter of the brain, which we'll talk about too, is the connection part. And so those are um, where we see these um, Schwann cells and the axon with a myelin sheath. That's sort of a fatty sheath, and you can think about it as um, um, a, a, a way to help the conductivity of the impulse and make it very efficient. Now, developmentally, what we see is that surprisingly we have um, less gray matter from childhood to adulthood. That sounds sort of puzzling, but of course you might have heard the reason for this, because at birth there are relatively few neuronal connections. Um, by six years of age, we have arborization. There's arbors being made in our brain. There's tremendous amount of connectivity in our brain, but the processes are not necessarily efficient. And so as we go through that process of adolescent, what, be, what happens is our brain connections become more efficient. You've probably heard of that term, you know, lose it, use it or lose it. And that basically is the brain because, in fact, the connections that we're using during this pruning process, 
So as the brain is getting rid of these connections in adolescence, um, it, what we're using, we're more likely to establish these connections. So that's why um, if you haven't started your figure skating career and you have decided today is the day, um, I'm not seeing enough youthful faces in here to think that you may actually be able to be an Olympian because you haven't used those neural connections. And it's similar in terms of our cognitive processes. They're quite similar in the way they work. This, of course, scares my undergraduates tremendously because they are realizing uh, adolescence was just um, not too long ago for them, and they're realizing they're on their closing window of time, that they, if they don't use it, they're going to lose it. Um, but I think, you know, some straight, um, scared straight tactics are okay, <laughs> periodically. So the white matter of our brain, those connections up with the axon, to the, um, that help the efficiency of the connections of the brain do continue to develop, in fact, until um, well into our 30s. And so through adolescence, we're becoming sort of the, the electrical impulses being um, transmitted more efficiently through that myelination process. And you might have heard of things like omega-3 and supplements like that, why you, why you eat your fish oil, and it's based on that, that particular part of your brain because we want those systems to be um, functioning well, and we do see that with elderly people that those systems um, um, lessen over time and it, it decreases the efficiency of your brain. So this is just a slide showing that the white matter of your brain does increase over time. Now I want to bring up one kind of um, normal picture of adolescence. Um, here what we see is that the brain is developing, those patterns are becoming more efficient, and this blue line that I'm showing you here that goes from childhood to adulthood has to do with the frontal lobe development and the executive control. You probably have heard, if not today, um, um, throughout the conference here, that, that um, our, our executive functioning continues to develop, our frontal lobe continues to develop into, well into young adulthood. And that um, is the evidence. Um, these processes become more efficient over time, and we have better connections between our frontal lobe and the other parts of the brain. So these connections become more established. And so this blue line here represents this continual pathway of our brains becoming better at planning and control over adolescence and into adulthood. But you'll also notice that red line, which is a little bit of a blip in the system, because we um, also become more likely to seek rewards in adolescence. So, seeking rewards. So our system of trying to get rewards quickly and easily um, increase our drive to get something that we want. Yes. Yeah. For example, say a 13-year-old um, had an injury to the frontal lobe, mm -hmm. uh, substantial injury but not brain damage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. So she was asking the question of if you have a, an injury to the frontal lobe, can it be completely yeah, compared at 13? Yeah. So um, we don't know exactly, depending on the case, of course, um, but the, um, the brain does have um, capacity to um, reroute those networks, and that's likely what would occur in this 13-year-old because those, that pruning process, that using process would be, be um, continuing during that period of development. And so that's why it's easier for a younger person to recover because they're actually rerouting their networks, um, the ones that aren't going to be um, reestablished um, as opposed to an elderly per person. It's harder to do the rerouting at that point. Very good question. And so we have this drive, this drive, this sensation seeking. That's what gets us into trouble in adolescence. That's what gets um, kids smoking and drinking and having sex and all those things that are fun, 
but can also get him into very deep trouble. And we have, similarly, we have this same pattern with stress reactivity and recovery. Because right then, as our systems are all go, get what I want right now, and not think quite as much about the future, it can be stressful to be getting what you want right now and not thinking about this, the future as well. And so we see that the stress system continues to be activated. Now, I, I spoke initially here about the brain systems, but the brain and the body are connected, right? They're one and the same. In fact, they work together. They give each other feedback. So the limbic system, where that amygdala was, I said, make a note of that, because right near there is the hypothalamus of the brain and the pituitary gland of the brain. And in our adrenal glands, which is in the abdomen, is um, another important network of this hormonal response. This is the HPA axis and the hormonal response. Once we get that signal that there's a threat to the system, it, it activates our physiology as well. So you might think, oh yeah, I know, because my heart rate elevates right away. In fact, our cortisol system, our stress reactive system with our hormones are not as easy to detect in terms of there's not necessarily like a feeling that's different, but often it would be activated sim simultaneously with the heart rate. So we would see all of these systems increase at the same time. So we have this system that gets activated. Eventually it um, secretes cortisol, what we call the stress hormone, to our body. It goes all throughout our body. It's in every aspect. It goes in our um, central nervous system, but it goes out to our blood and our, our saliva and our urine. So it's, it's circulated all throughout our body. And, and, um, and it occurs in on diurnal patterns. So it happens on a D daily basis. In fact, we have stress hormones circulating in our body right now. Well, maybe I have a couple more stress hormones than you all do. I mean, hopefully I do. Um, but it happens um, on a, a diurnal basis. And what we see is that uh, this regular pattern of stress, it helps us get ready for the day. Um, it's, it elevates its highest in the morning, right when we get up. And then it drops throughout the day. And when we're ready to go to sleep at night, it should be the lowest that it's going to be all day long. That will help us get back to sleep. But we, and so with the stressor, like the bear, what we see is that our cortisol or these stress hormones get activated. So you'll see this graph. That's what a typical pattern should look like if you are activated by some kind of a threat. Um, in your environment like a bear. So your stress hormone should be elevated and then they should move down. This negative feedback system right here is important because it lets us know the bear is gone. We don't have to continue to have a high heart rate. We don't have to continue to have cortisol um, circulating throughout our body. What, my, what is interesting is that we've just recently, this is a 2011 article, we've just been um, recently understanding about the adolescent hormonal system and the normal developmental changes that occur in the adolescent um, system. And we see that, um, that, in fact, this pattern occurs. We activate to stress and we diminish to, to, um, when the stressor is abated. Um, and you'll see there that males actually activate a little higher to stress um, than females do. And that's what we've seen um, across um, adolescence and even into adulthood. Males typically activate a little bit um, quicker to stressors with their physiological systems. But you may also notice that females, and the older, um, it's hard to see on this graph, but the oldest female is that highest red line coming down there, um, continue to activate a little bit longer. So as you're moving through adolescence, those girls, these are typically developing adolescent girls, don't shut off that system quite as quickly. And so they continue to have a little bit more um, cortisol circulating in their system. The way that we um, look at um, stress tests in our laboratory is 
um, we would love to bring in a bear and um, be able to really stress people in that way, but we've heard that it's not ethical to do such a thing. And so we do something relatively mild that seems to be extremely effective. You've, we've all had to give book reports or maybe give an exam in front of an audience, and this is our audience of undergraduates that are dressed up like lab technicians. And um, the participants are asked to prepare a speech, give a five-minute speech, and then do, do a mental arithmetic in front of this audience. And, um, you know, you would think, oh, well, that might not be so activating, but in fact, it is. Um, even they've done it with hundreds of studies um, to show that it is um, stress, um, uh, that we elicit a stress response with this paradigm. Um, typical people do. Even medical students, who presumably would be pretty good at math, um, respond in this similar way. And so um, we ask them then to spit into that little vial right there. Saliva is really nice because you can ask them to spit multiple times. We don't have to get a spinal tap or a blood draw. Um, and um, it would be hard to ask them to um, pee in a cup five minute, at five or ten minute intervals. You can imagine that would be difficult to do. But spit we can usually elicit. So those are the ways that we look at s stress paradigms in the laboratory. There's other paradigms, but this is really one of the most commonly used. Okay, so that gives us a background what the brain looks like, the development of the brain, the development of this physiological system. How might the development go awry? Well, we're going to use an example of depression today. And the two concepts that I want you to keep in mind as we're thinking about this is that the first concept has to do with brain plasticity. So the extent in this that, did I plant you for that question there? Because um, your question actually had to do with brain plasticity. Uh, this idea that the brain can respond to new experiences and recover from injury. And in fact, that is a characteristic of um, the developing brain. It's open to new developments as it's, the development is ongoing. So. This plasticity, or the way that the brain is plastic, actually diminishes with uh, time. And so that's why you wouldn't see an older person recovering from the brain injury the same way you would a younger person. Um, it used to be thought that the brain developed primarily in adolescence, and all of the um, brain development that was occurring had occurred at that point, because in fact all of the brain structures are in place at that time. But we now know that there's tremendous plasticity, a, a, an important window of plasticity that's occurring in adolescence and into early adulthood. So this um, developmental period is important. New synopsis form um, over time. And there's some areas of the brain that actually are relatively plastic even into adulthood, but often um, most of the areas of the brain um, decrease in plasticity. The second um, point I want to, principle, general principle. So the first thing I want you to think about is that the brain is malleable or plastic. It can change. The second one I want you to think about is these sensible, sensitive periods, these optimal time intervals for development to occur. Now, you might remember way back into intro to psychology or something like that where you learned about Lorenz and how his ducks would follow him around if he was the first moving object that they saw or that during this very specific window in the duck's life. They would start following him around instead of their duck mother because he was moving. And similarly, we actually have similar kinds of sensitive periods. You might have um, been wanting to learn a new language, and um, if you were in your 40s, it might be much more difficult for you than if you were a pre-adolescent, because we know that those centers um, that establish particularly pronunciation of a new language um, 
diminish over time, and so that a 13-year-old can learn the pronunciations, hear the language much better than a 40-year-old. And we have various other kinds of um, paradigms that have been used. Even in terms of um, um, adverse events, there's certain windows that will um, provide a opportunity for this adverse event to interact with the neurobiological system. If you had, you know, a six pack of beer and you're 40 years of age, it's not going to affect your brain the same way it would the fetal brain, right? And so, and this bottom picture is a picture of a child with fetal alcohol syndrome, but these same ideas are um, based on um, other kinds of neurotoxins like thalidomide. And as we're thinking, um, in addition to these ideas of brain plasticity and sensitive periods, we think about developing of the system in terms of both um, diatheses or the genetic part of the system and the environmental part and how the system interacts with both of these aspects. The probability is might be increased of a disorder if you have both propensities in terms of the genetic and environmental characteristics. And so I'm going to actually focus a little bit more on some of these um, um, neurobiological factors that we think are influenced by genetics and environment. I'm not going to be talking as much about some of the proximal factors, but um, Mimi Sain will um, be talking about some of those factors later in um, her talk today, so that will be um, useful. We know that with depression, um, major depressive disorder, which is one of the primary mood disorders that we see um, in adolescence, um, is, has a, more contributions from the environment than it does from genetics. So unlike disorders like bipolar disorder or schizophrenia or autism, which we think are highly heritable disorders, major depressive disorder is a moderately heritable disorder. So there, there definitely is some genetic contributions, but we also know that environment plays an important role in the, in the um, evidence. We've um, looked at some of the genes of people that have depression. And with animal studies, they can do really interesting things, like they can take out that gene, a, a particular gene that might contribute to depression. We call it knockout. So they knock that out of the system, and they find that the mice look depressed. This is an example of a, a mother mouse who had this um, particular knockout of the um, the GABA receptor, um, which isn't so important to know which receptor because there's many genes that would contribute um, to depression. Um, but what she did, um, most mothers of mice bring them close and build a nest and keep them warm and fed. And they do a lot of licking and grooming to help the development of their young mice. And this m mother mouse, her babies on the right there are scattered all over. They're cold, they're not fed, and they're, um, the one on the far right there um, dies. And so we see the direct effects in terms of maternal care and what happens when a mother is depressed. <clears throat> we also can learn some really interesting things about rodent research that are applicable um, because we can do things with rodents that we can't do with humans. And so we try and learn the lessons of what might be applicable for humans as well. There's, um, again, with mice, we see that um, if the mouse is taken from their mother's nest during days 2 to 14, taken, handled by a human, separated from their mom, and then eventually put back, done that every day between age 2 and 14, we see that in adulthood, their neurobiological stress systems are altered. We wouldn't do, now this doesn't sound like abuse, right? We're not talking about like hanging a mouse up by its tail or something like that. But just this disruption of this developmental 
task that the mother is supposed to be licking and grooming and keeping that mouse close to her. That's what the um, needs of the mouse are. Just the disruption in this can actually cause the neurobiological stress system to be altered in that adult mouse. 